Marcy Krivenen is standing by live near Interstate 90 with more on this staggering statistic. Marcy. Mark, Highway Patrol officials say they responded to 12 crashes in total in western Montana alone, including those seven fatalities. They say 4th of July usually carries a lot of crashes, but this year seems especially bad. Marcy Krivenen was at the Red Cross shelter. She joined us live from Florence with information on that now. Marcy. That's right, Jill. The Red Cross began setting up their shelter at the Florence Carlton School on Old Highway 93 around 8 o'clock this evening. The shelter has food and water available and will have mental and physical health services soon. It's set up to service thousands, but when we were there, there were no evacuees present. Now, we did go to the Florence Fire Department where we spoke with some firefighters. They said they spoke with one family who lost a cabin and another family who lost a residence to the flames. They say many evacuees seem to be taking refuge with family and friends. Now, once again, that uh, Red Cross Center is on Old Highway 93 at, at the high school there. And the phone number is uh, available to call, and that shelter is also open 24 hours. Reporting live in Florence, Marcy Krivenen, now back to you. All right, thanks, Marcy. Marcy Krivenen spoke to officials who are monitoring that fire, and she joins us now live from Florence with the latest. Marcy. That's right, Jill. So far, the fire is reported at 950 acres and 40% contained, and two structures have been confirmed lost. Marcy Krivenen joins us live in the studio with details. Marcy. Mark, the potential change of date stems from an appeal the government filed, a move defense attorneys call surprising. Marcy Krivenen was in the courtroom, and she joins us now live. Marcy. Mark, 29-year-old Timothy Limke faces seven charges, including vehicular homicide while under the influence. Joined by his attorney, Limke appeared in justice court today. His charges stem from an early morning accident on Interstate 90 Tuesday. Court documents say Limke drove the wrong way and hit a vehicle carrying a family from Helena. In court, prosecuting officials read notes from the case prosecutor, Deputy County Attorney Dale Murkich. The defendant was traveling at highway speeds the wrong way on I-90 at night. His pickup truck flipped over after impact, and that caused full and empty beer bottles to be strewn about the inside of the cab. The notes were meant to convince the judge to keep Limke behind bars with a high bail amount. Limke's attorney contested Murkic's words, saying Limke was not a flight risk and was prepared to enroll in an alcohol treatment program. The judge sided with Murkic and set Limke's bail at half a million dollars. There were two children involved in that crash, ages four and five. At last word, the father and five-year-old child were released from the hospital. The four-year-old child is still receiving treatment. Live in the studio, Marcy Krivenen reporting. Mark, back to you. Marcy Krivenen was in the courtroom. She joined us now live. Marcy. Jill, 19-year-old Jonah War could face five years behind bars and a large fine for just one count of arson. But federal prosecutors say War admitted starting 19 wildfires, including the Gash Creek Fire, two on Blue Mountain, and the Mormon Peak Fires. A human-caused fire burning outside Victor threatened homes when it started in July. The 8,500-acre Gash Creek fire is just one of several fires local and federal agents have been investigating. A government document says a lot of the fires had similar features, with most being adjacent to a road and started in a grassy area using an open flame. After evidence was collected, law enforcement officials made an arrest. 19-year-old Jonah War of Florence was arrested for arson. The government says War admits to setting nearly two dozen fires, including the Gash Creek. In the document, War admits using a lighter to start grasses on fire next to roads. Also in the complaint, a small red car was noticed at several areas where the fires began. The description matched War's vehicle. The complaint lists all the fires starting between July 24th and September 1st. War admits to starting fires at Hidden Valley, the Lolo Fireworks Stand, and the second Woodchuck Fire. In court today, a judge placed War in the custody of the U.S. Marshal. Live in the studio, Marcy Krivenen reporting. Now back to you. Marcy Krivenen met with one firefighter who saw the terror firsthand. She joins us now live in the studio. Marcy. Mark, Missoula Rural Fire Department's Tom Ziegler says the aftermath of America's worst terror attack is indescribable. Before it happened, he made friends and worked with a group of firefighters from Queens, most of whom he never saw again. 
know, out of all the all the friends that I had and everything, we were, we were, that I was involved with, we only found one. Before digging through the rubble to find his friends at Ground Zero, Fire Captain Tom Ziegler worked with them one week every year for nearly a decade. When the attack happened, Ziegler says he tried desperately to get a hold of them by phone. I finally got through to my friend, and uh, you know, just to make sure he was okay. He said he was, but there was a lot of people that were gone, and a lot of people were missing. So. Ziegler says news of his friend's deaths shook him up. He says he knew he had to go to Ground Zero. I've been in this service now for about 32 years, and I thought I saw everything. I've been involved in some horrible crashes. I've lost close friends in car accidents and everything else. I was never expected to see this ever. One week after the attacks, Ziegler says dust still clung to the air, and rescue workers could hardly find any survivors. They weren't finding anybody. It's just like they were gone. And a lot of the basement, the bottom area, became um, you know, a tomb um, uh, for cremation. Five years later, Ziegler says he still struggles with survivor's guilt, mostly because his week with the New York crew was scheduled the week of the attacks. Whether it was pure regret. luck or a fluke, Ziegler was held Everybody up one week, a mishap that probably saved his life. Regardless, the firefighter says the sights and smells of Manhattan still haunt him, and he says it will be a long time before he returns. Now, ever since the attacks, Ziegler says he memorializes the day by calling his friend, the lone survivor in New York City, and the two remember their friends and catch up. Reporting live in the studio, Marcy Krivenin, now back to you. And Marcy joins us live with more. Marcy? Mark, 78-year-old Edward Duncan lived in Slidell, Louisiana when Hurricane Katrina ripped through, destroying homes and lives there. One year later, Duncan says his life in western Montana is an improvement over living in the south. I look out my window now and I see mountains and a beautiful meadow. When I looked out my window in Slidell, all I saw was a parking lot. And I must say this is a great improvement. Hurricane Katrina evacuee Edward Duncan lives in a Stevensville assisted living center. He arrived here one year ago when family living in Florence took him under their wing following the destruction of his Slidell, Louisiana home. It hit the uh, assisted living facility where I had been staying and it uh, swept the, the whole inside of that facility away. Duncan missed the wrath of the hurricane by one day, but when he left for higher ground in Mississippi, he had to leave several possessions behind, like clothing, books, and his prized piano. A few months later, Duncan's son-in-law left for Slidell to retrieve the still intact piano. Just like saving me in Mississippi, he saved a part of my heart, which is the piano. Now Duncan is grateful for a new, comfortable home. Uh, you know, we could do something to help you with that. And doesn't mind the views out his window. In the winter, I get deer out here. Duncan says he spent most his life in the South, but now that he's here in Montana, he's traded his Southern roots for a cowboy hat. Well, I'll dare to, to uh, model it. And says he loves his Western Montana life. Marcy Krivenin went along and she joins us now live. Marcy? Mark, fire officials drove four people to their properties so they could grab things like clothes and important documents. Because fire, fire danger still exists, they are not allowed to move back in for good. But as they discovered, one glimpse of home relieves several days of concern. Hey, there's some grass up there. The bumpy one-lane road to Mark Kuhlman's home is surrounded by charred timber and blackened ground. Small puffs of smoke emerge from underground, evidence a large wildland fire moved through the area. Kuhlman is one of 12 homeowners evacuated from the heavily treed Upper Woodchuck area. Now he's getting his first glimpse of how the fire affected his property. There was so much smoke coming out of this draw that I thought it would be totally black all through here, but, but it looks really good. Thanks to tree thinning, round-the-clock work by firefighters and a little luck, Coleman's home is intact. It's just 
kind of one of those natural things that happened. Just the trees were spaced apart enough or something, and and the fire just luckily missed this place. Others are not so lucky. A few miles down the road lies the charred and twisted structure of what used to be a trailer home. Only a few items remain, evidence someone used to call the place home. Meanwhile, at Kuhlman's house, a few items are placed in a wheelbarrow to take back to his wife and children. Despite a blackened backyard, though, Kuhlman and his neighbors agree the fire is naturally burning forested areas in need of clearing. To live in the area, they say it's understood fire could come through. But regardless, they are relieved this blaze barely missed their homes. As Marcy Krivenen reports, the projects are meant to upgrade aging structures and provide more for travelers. The Missoula International Airport is flying to new heights on the ground. Recent construction projects have not only changed the appearance of the main building, they are also projected to boost security and efficiency. Our overriding goal in all of these projects is, is operating a safe and efficient uh, airport that meets the needs of, you know, of our flying public. And with half a million travelers going in and out of the building each year, airport officials say the upgrades are timely. The projects include an addition to the terminal, new pavement for the runways, relocation of a major satellite, new sky bridges, and a new structure to house fire trucks for quick response. The feds are funding most of the projects, carrying a hefty price tag. All combined, we're looking at a little over $8 million worth of construction this summer. New flights are also added. Jensen says more flights to and from Las Vegas, Denver, and Salt Lake City, and an added service to Chicago are now in place. Our air service picture has been very positive. Uh, we continue to talk to the airlines and hopefully uh, increase that. National security concerns have boosted operations at the airport but have not slowed construction. As always, construction workers must go through security before starting work on site and airport officials do recommend travelers arrive a little bit earlier. But other than that, construction projects are moving forward and are slated to be complete by the end of the year. In Missoula, Marcy Krivenen for Montana's news station. Woodworkers say anybody can do this, but it takes 800 to 1,000 hours to complete an entire animal. Organizers say the event continues to gain success. This year, nearly 40 campers will ride down the river in these 20 boats. Good afternoon. Thank you for joining us here on your new news. I'm Marcy Krivenen. With midterm elections just around the corner, the president is mounting a major push to promote the war in Iraq. But will that message be enough to sway voters toward candidates with a pro-war stance? Jennifer Miller has the latest from Washington, D.C.